Uh, my name is Franz Fischer. I'm the director of the Venice Center for Digital Public Humanities, and uh, we are very glad to uh, uh, start uh, yet another edition of our cycle uh, in uh, of seminars in digital and public humanities, organized as always by Stefano Dallaglio. Thank you very much in collaboration together this cycle uh, and also the last one with Benedetta Bessi, who is presenting uh, 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 here today, and I will. Uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a minute, we'll introduce you to uh, Benedetta. Uh, please allow me to make some uh, announcement. First, a technical announcement. So this will be recorded. It's recording already in progress. Okay, because we are going to publish then the um, seminar on our YouTube channel as we used to do. And so please be aware if you engage in the discussion and what we hope that you will do, uh, that uh, uh, this will be then visible on, on YouTube. But I mean, nothing to be afraid of. Um, Apart from this, this is all technical. So please uh, post links, reference, comments also during the talk in the chat, and we will try to uh, um, um, react on this, or people will be happy for any uh, additional information or, or comments that you make. And after the um, presentation, there will be lots of space uh, and room to uh, discuss the project. Uh, and uh, the field, and it's an interdisciplinary seminar, so questions are very welcome from any background, so you don't have to be an expert of uh, Bo Del Monte. Uh, so any question from all directions are very welcome, and maybe the more interesting one for the whole uh, group of participants. Uh, just uh, some more announcements, so because this is the first seminar of our cycle uh, here in uh, autumn of this academic year. We just closed uh, a, a conference uh, that we have been hosting at Kafoska, uh, a great uh, conference on media art histories. So uh, we are already in full steam at, as a center. Uh, you can look up all the information details of uh, past and upcoming events on our website. We will now also uh, revise our social media strategy so to make sure everyone uh, gets information that uh, is of potential interest uh, for you. Um, everyone is welcome also to apply for membership. So we are a center at the Department for Humanities at Kaposkari. And uh, it is a members driven center, so uh, everyone can participate also officially uh, with an affiliation. There has been a Google, Google um, um, questionnaire or form to uh, join the center or to make this request that has just been stopped by our uh, university uh, IT service center. But we are setting this up again. So at the moment, it's sufficient if you just write an email to our institutional email address, vdph at uh, uh, at Univé, uh, IT, or to me personally, or any other team member here, and that will be forwarded. And then you will uh, um, uh, surely accept it as an affiliated or a full member, so depending on your status or connection to the department. Uh, upcoming, uh, an announcement, we shared this on uh, several mailing lists just today, uh, an online conference organized by our visiting professor, uh, Peter Robinson, uh, and uh, with support from Anies Machiarelli and myself, uh, 5th and 6th October on um, editing the text, editing the page in large textual traditions. So you can look the program up on our website, uh, all online. So uh, everyone welcome to participate and uh, a link for registration is uh, uh, also on the website. Uh, then connected closely to the work of Benedetta uh, and her uh, uh, fellowship as a Marie Curie fellow, uh, um, we will have a full week of exchange with colleagues from Stanford. Um, uh, we maybe um, uh, Benedetta will also elaborate a little bit on that collaboration. And uh, there is also a full program uh, with uh, sessions, events, and uh, um, activities, which we will post uh, uh, shortly on all our channels. 
Uh, and then in November, uh, yet another conference, the Click It conference of the uh, Italian Association of uh, Computational Linguists, organized by uh, Federico Boschetti and Gianluca Lebani. Um, so also information on our website or get in contact with the people directly. But now uh, I will introduce you to Benedetta Bessi, uh, Bessi so a local uh, matador here since... Uh, the beginning of her fellowship uh, and uh, so she uh, her project is uh, focused on uh, uh, Cristoforo Buondelmonti's Liber Insularum from the 5th century uh, and on the origin of, cl of classical archaeology so I hope uh, we have also some archaeologists here uh, on the field there will be actually a conference connected to the Stanford visit uh, on the dates of uh, 12th and 13th of October. 12th, 13th of October. Also, that, that program as part of the entire program will be published very soon, I think on Friday, on Monday at the latest. Uh, and um, yeah, her work as an, uh, as an a classical archaeologist, uh, Benedetta has conducted research and fieldwork in Italy, Greece, uh, Syria, Libya, and she traveled extensively all over the globe. So uh, Archaeologist is a, a nice um, profession, so uh, North Africa, Eastern Mediterranean, and the Middle East. And here at our center, her research and uh, expertise has been matched with digital humanities uh, and computer-based approaches. And she presented and talk about the results of this collaboration here uh, uh, and now. Uh, present in the audience, uh, I didn't verify, but I hope so, is also Daniel Fudi, so a very important collaborator and software developer here in our team, who uh, took care and facilitated uh, uh, the digital aspects of, of the project and the realization. And he is also available for discussion and questions for all the more technical uh, um, uh, aspects of, of um, Benedetta's project. So uh, enough for this. Now the floor is open to Benedetta. Thank you for uh, being here and uh, presenting and uh, your, your project here to the audience. I think I move to the sofa. We have a sofa okay. here just in front of uh, the, the panel here. Okay. So uh, it's worthwhile really to consider also um, participating in person. So from next time, uh, yeah. So I move to the sofa and nah, uh, and I'm I'm coming back for the for the discussion then. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I leave you alone okay. if that's fine with you. Oh. Then I can see the slides. Ah, one final uh, announcement. We also have, so I forget, now I see it here. I don't know what you see, if you see my camera or Benedetta's camera. We just have another publication of our um, uh, uh, series uh, on uh, uh, disclosing collections from our uh, former colleague, uh, Diego Mantuan, who created a, a beautiful catalog on the archive of the Museum of Mario Rimondi in Cortina d'Ampezzo. Uh, there is another uh, volume just published by, uh, curated by Sabrina Minuzzi on uh, Venetian gardens and herbaria. And uh, we also published in this, during the summer break our journal, uh, Magazine, uh, International Journal for Digital Public Humanities on the concept of relations. Uh, so that's also online, freely accessible for everyone. And uh, a second issue is uh, in the course of being curated by Paolo Berti, also a colleague art historian here at our center, uh, about the concept of mega dungeons as a concept to organize uh, humanities data. So just uh, an additional note on uh, the publications that we run here. So that was not really to you, sorry, but uh, I had to say it. Okay, so thank you, Franz, for this presentation, and thank you to everybody uh, in the VDPH team for inviting me to this uh, presentation, and also for the friendship and support you gave me since the beginning of the project. I still remember the first conversation I had with Franz. I think it was back in 2019 when I was drafting and conceiving the Marie Curie proposal. So it's in a certain sense, very emotional to be here today at the end of the three year project, being able to 
discuss something that is becoming, I hope, uh, a reality. So yes, my uh, project is a Marie Curie global project, which means is a three year action that started in uh, 2020 and it's ending in a month. It's uh, uh, carried out in collaboration between Cap Foscari and uh, Stanford University. There was initially an outgoing phase of uh, two years, which I was able only in part to do in presence. Unfortunately, because of COVID, the first year was uh, remote. But the good thing about it is that while in Italy, I had the opportunity to link even better with Kafoskari and in particular with the VDPH people and starting the um, digital component even before moving to the States. Uh, in addition to the VDPH, the other digital center is SETA, the Center for Spatial and Textual Analysis at Stanford. Uh, where uh, my supervisor, Giovanna Cesarani, is also located. And as Franz mentioned, one of the good things about this collaboration is that starting from my project and then another Marie Curie project led by Valentina Dalcin, who is part of the audience today, there is now a sort of a, an agreement, a partnership that is going on and hopefully continuing even beyond our um, projects. So the focus of the project is uh, the study of the Liber Insularum by Cristoforo Buondelmonti with the idea of underlining the importance of his travels and his work in the origins of classical archaeology. I am myself a classical archaeologist, so my interest on this material is uh, reflecting this perspective. And uh, part of the action implied the creation of a digital edition. Of course, today here, uh, I will focus first on giving you a little bit of background on Cristoforo Bondelmonti and his work so that you can understand the importance, or at least the reason why I thought this would be useful, my approach to this material and um, some of the technicalities. And uh, in the end, the parts that I was very interested since the beginning, the visualization, the front end, because one of the um, goals of this project was to create something that is not only scientifically and academically useful, hopefully, but also available to a larger audience uh, directly online. Now, for some of you who have heard the story already, probably some of this material is already well known. I know in the audience there are some other Wonder Monkeys colleagues, and I thank them for um, being here today, but I'll uh, be brief. So who is Cristoforo Buondelmonti? He uh, was born around 1380, 1390. We are not sure about the dates because we don't have any external source about this um, author, but the hints present in his work. So everything has to be calculated based on other references, but more or less, we think that he was born in this uh, decade. We also know that he is part of a minor branch. Yes. Excuse me. Uh, these beautiful slides are covered for the audience here. Oh, That's sorry. The room. So maybe we can uh, minimize this. Slide. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Would be a pity otherwise. Yeah, yeah. This sorry, I was somewhere else. Like that. Oh, sorry, Link. Uh, we can't get rid of this. Uh... Yeah, probably at the very bottom or at the very top. Okay. And we can have it. Uh, um, this. Oh, no, I'm missing it. Mm -hmm. It's good that you are doing it as long as I don't do it. I close this. Yeah. I think so. Okay, sorry. No, thank you. 
So um, as I was saying, he was born into a minor branch of a Florentine aristocratic family, the Bondelmonti. They are mentioned by Dante and they are considered as the starter of the famous feud between the Guelph and the Ghibellines. We know that he uh, started a career as presbyter of a church in Florence, the Church of Santa Maria Soprano, which doesn't exist anymore because it was destroyed at the end of the 19th century for the building of the Lungarni, but that we know belong to that family. And among other things that are very significant, especially from my own perspective, is the fact that in one of his minor works, he considered, he defined two very prominent scholars of the time as his teacher. And these are Coluccio Salutati and Domenico Bandini. These are very prominent uh, scholars that were very involved in the rediscovery of Greek and the promotion of Greek studies in Florence. And the fact that he was able to uh, attend he, uh, their lessons probably explained his interest in Greece and his later decision to move to the Greek islands. No, it's not moving. So yeah, um, Coluccio Saludati in uh, particular was very involved in the promotion of Greek studies because we know that it was him who at the end of the 14th century invited the Byzantine scholar Manuel Crisolora to Florence and appointed him on behalf of the Florentine Republic as professor of Greek studies, hence creating what is considered the first chair of Greek studies in the West. At some point, however, Bondelmonti left Florence and moved to Rhodes. Again, the date for his move has to be uh, postulated, but uh, it probably happened around 1414. The definition he gives is exacta adolescentia, but of course the period in, in Latin and in, uh, in that time is, is different from the teen years that we can um, imagine. But um, we know that it must be around 1414 for other reasons as well. We know that he established his base in Rhodes. Rhodes at that time was a very cosmopolitan and active center because of the presence of the Knights of St. John that had left Jerusalem and transferred to the island. And from there, he toured and visited all the Greek islands. Of course, I'm going to expand more on this. Uh, the latest attestation about Bondelmonti's life is uh, some document archives where we see that in 1430, he was still in Rhodes, where he was covering the office. Of, I mean, he was um, the dean of the Catholic Cathedral of Rhodes. After that, we, we lose track. We don't know if he ever made it back to Florence or if he continued to um, live in uh, Greece. Uh, the results of his uh, travels were his two most famous works. The first one is the Descriptio Insule Crete, a description of the island of Crete. There are several versions, but the first one came out in uh, 1417. It's a description of the island based on his in-depth tour around the island with a circumnavigation and also a horseback uh, ride across Crete. We know that he was traveling in company of another prominent uh, humanist, Rinuccio Aretino, who later became Lorenzo Valla, teacher of Greek. 
And we also know that um, the descriptio was dedicated to Niccolò Niccoli, a Florentine wealthy merchant and avid manuscript collector. Among other things, we know that at least seven Greek manuscripts arrived in Florence, both by Cristoforo Buondelmonti on different islands and made it to the library of Niccolò Niccoli. So we understand that Niccoli was probably behind Buondelmonti and had an interest in Buondelmonti visiting the island to acquire manuscripts. However, the most uh, famous uh, work by Juan del Monte is the Liber Insularum Archipelagi. It's dedicated to Cardinale Giordano Orsini, another prominent character of the time and a uh, humanist himself. It's conceived as a Liber Figuratus, so a uh, a book with figure, as Bondelmonti himself describes it, which means that the textual description of the islands is matched by a map. So every island is not only described in words, but also described in uh, maps. There are about 90 paragraphs and corresponding islands. The islands uh, included not only the uh, archipelago, strictly speaking, but also the Ionian Islands, because coming from Italy, it's actually the Ionian Islands that um, he deals with. Then all the Aegean Islands, and uh, the only exception to this, so to say, insularity, are Gallipoli on the mainland, Constantinople, and Mount Athos. The Liber Insularum enjoy great popularity. In fact, there are more than 70 manuscript copies ranging from the 15th to the 16th century. Uh, we don't have the original uh, autograph version of the Liber, uh, but they attest, as I said, the, the bestseller, so to say, status because they, um, the book circulated not only in Latin, but also in Italian, English, French, and Greek translations. And uh, the copies range in um, color and uh, quality from very basic to very extravagant, as you can see, for example, in uh, this manuscript. The same concept with various examples. The Liber itself has a very complex textual tradition. I'll briefly refer to it, but as I explained from the beginning of the project, the scope of this edition and in general my approach goes beyond philological issues or codicology. Um, Anyway, what we can reconstruct about the textual tradition is that there was a first edition sometimes before 1420. This edition is not attested by any manuscript copy, but it's implied by his wording when the second edition came out in 1420. This second edition is uh, attested by two manuscripts only, one in the Ambrosiana in Milan, the other one in Ravenna. And then there was a shorter version of the second edition that came out in 1422, the so-called Vulgata. Vulgata is, is a term used by the modern uh, scholarship. This version is the one attested by the majority of the manuscripts, including the one that I'm using for my own digital edition, and also um, the various um, published editions that uh, circulate at the time. There was then a third edition in 1430, which nowadays is attested only in a Marquisian 
vernacular translation in a manuscript in the Vatican. This very complicated textual uh, history explains probably also why the Liber Insularum has not received the attention it deserved in the scholarship, because for a long time, scholars have attempted to recreate a codipological line for the manuscripts failing, and therefore they haven't, they haven't been um, uh, recent uh, publications. In my choice, the manuscript I'm using is a manuscript from the Gennadios Library in Athens, attesting the data. Uh, the reason for this choice is uh, based on various uh, factors. First of all, it's a complete manuscript. So the, there is the entire text and the entire map apparatus, which is not always the case with the many other manuscripts. Uh, the maps are um, annotated. Some of the maps in other manuscripts do not have any annotation. And the color range used uh, is very close to the tree chromis, so very essential basic color pattern mentioned by Juan del Monte himself, who uh, explains how he's using black, white, and uh, green. This is also the manuscript that, from the point of view of an archaeology, is the most familiar because Juan del Monte has been used by archaeologists working in Greece and the Greek islands very uh, often, especially when it comes to reconstruct the history of the excavations and research on various islands. And because, of course, of the local availability, the Gennadius manuscript before the digital availability of manuscripts online is the one that archaeologists have uh, exploited the most. Here, I'm just going to scroll through some examples of how the manuscript look like. For those of you present in the room, you can also take a look at the whole thing in uh, photocopies. So here you have an example of Corfu. Corfu is the one that we will analyze in greater depth when I will show you an example of the front end of the project. Um, the maps themselves often have issues with the orientation. In this case, you see that uh, there still is the north-south inversion, as is typical in uh, ancient cartography. In addition to that, for what concerns the um, Ionian island in particular, there was a problem because the, the, the pre-modern cartography tended to align them a lot more with the Albanian mainland than they really are. But uh, at the same time, you can already start appreciating the, the peculiarity of Juan del Monte's map. In fact, even in the history of cartography, Juan del Monte's map have attracted a lot of attention. I should say that Juan del Monte has been uh, the object of studies first as a cartographer and only more recently for uh, its uh, content, because we see that it's a very original for design approach to cartography where components from the portulans, so the charts used by seafarers, uh, underlining the profile of the coast, are then combined with um, details seen in a sort of a bird's eye perspective, where you can see not only the physical features, so not only mountains and uh, rivers, and uh, the coast outline, but also references to the presence of settlements, castles, ruins, and other um, 
fissures connected to human activity. And in this sense, it's considered uh, a very new original way. Of course, as I told you, we don't have the original manuscript, so we don't know exactly how the originals look like, but in all the maps, there are certain common features that allow us to say that this is a component that he introduced and that it's very different from the Portulan charts that we have for uh, the same Greek islands until this moment. Uh, I should also tell you that the Liber Insularum uh, is considered now the starter of a literary gender in itself, the Isolari, so the books of the island, which is then a gender that flourished in Florence first, but then in particular here in uh, Venice. So here you see Corfu, next you see Paxos. This is just a quick uh, stroll through the island. Uh, Crete, Crete, of course, it's well detailed because if you remember, he wrote an entire book dedicated to Crete. This is just a selection. Delos and uh, Renea, the, the island in front. So you can see that the level of detail and accuracy is not always the same. Some islands are richer, others are a little bit more basic. Here you have Chios. Chios in many manuscripts appear as a very detailed island, and we know that it was also uh, an active center of transcription of the Liber. In fact, one of the earliest dated copy of the Vulgata was copied on Chios. If you could look in detail, you would see how he's documenting the location of the uh, tomb of Homer, which supposedly was located on the island. The little Christmas tree, as I call it, uh, is a reference to the presence of the Mastica tree, a very special feature of Chios. It's actually the lentisk. It's a Mediterranean plant, but that only in Chios produced a gum that was very um, popular and uh, the, the object of an active trade around the Mediterranean and so on. See, here you have Lesbos and uh, Tenedos. For Tenedos, it's interesting how he located on the mainland in front and described also in the text, the location of Troy, it's actually the earliest reference to an actual location of Homeric Troy. The ruins he's describing, of course, are not the Schliemann Troy. They refer to the Hellenistic Roman settlement of Troy. But the reference, for example, to the presence of fortification and towers, which dates to the Roman period, is accurate. and. It's, it's a feature of this later settlement still, still visible. This is Constantinople, Limno, and now to the digital edition. So the idea of the digital edition came from the desire, in a certain sense, first of all, to make this text uh, more available to a larger community. And also, even if back then I came from mm, almost no background in digital humanities, the understanding that thanks to the digital dimension and the possibility to combine text and uh, geospatial analysis, there would be a, a great opportunity to maximize the, the value of uh, the liber as a liber figurato as something that combines both components. In the digital edition, I am um, offering a Latin text transcription, an English translation, and then a commentary where I am, of course, explaining names and um, 
questions of historical, archaeological, and geographical interest mainly, and connecting these uh, names and entities to other resources present uh, online and uh, already very much in use in the community of digital archaeologists, such as Pleiades, Topos, Dex, or uh, Manto. Uh, there uh, is going to be the possibility to access the material also directly through the map. And also, I would like, and I'm working uh, making sure that this is going to happen, to keep it ability for, for users to contribute and expand and even improve the existing comments. Part of the work is based on pre-existing material because in reality, I had started to work on Wondel Monti and a traditional commentary way before the starting of the project. So I had a lot of legacy data in the form of words and as I said, from the beginning, I wanted uh, this project to have a nice user-friendly front end for users. To do this, I was able to um, contact a company based in Luca who are helping me um, creating this front end um, output. Thanks to the generosity of the Stanford University, who was contributing toward the expenses. In my commentary, as I mentioned, I'm going to pay attention mostly to geographical names, names of historical and mythological characters, quotations of ancient authors, ancient monuments and sites, medieval fortifications, churches, and folklore and local tradition and lifestyle of the inhabitants. As a tool, as Franz mentioned at uh, the beginning, from quite the beginning of uh, the action, I was lucky to meet Daniele, who back then was a fellow researcher here at the VDPH, and uh, who I then uh, uh, contacted and made the DH consultant specifically for the um, project. Uh, we are then using his Cadmos, this um, uh, tool that uh, works as a sort of a content generator database that allows an open data architecture and uh, open editing hub for highly structured content whatever its relation with text, textual data, metatextual data, as layer, non textual data. It can also be integrated with other resources, such as the gazette as I mentioned, or bibliographic services or image services, such as IIIF. And um, I'm skipping to, <laughs> to um, the end, it's working with legacy data, which was an important uh, requirement in uh, my case, and can remodel the legacy data in order to be distributed into parts that can be continuously expanded and uh, uh, modeled to fit the growing needs of the project. The, uh, the material can um, also be uh, exported in uh, TEI, HTML, or PDF, or any other format, even if, as I said, for the moment, I'm focusing on the creation of this front-end app to show the digital edition online. If you then have more technical problems, Daniele is here, and if you have questions, you can uh, ask him. Is a little bit of the workflow, but so here is. Sorry, you you were. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just okay. Yeah. No. No. Thirty seconds. Okay. No. No. Just because I thought I had showed this already, but it's okay. 
So as you can see, there is the possibility to use legacy data. And with Cartmus as the database organizer, we can then connect to external sources, I mean, services like Pleiades or, for example, IIIF, and then uh, export the data in uh, any format, also suitable, among other things, for the use on the web, which is then what I'm going to show you with the front end. Yeah. Sorry, I thought I had shown this already many times, but probably not everybody has seen. So the, the idea is then to have a, a final web page. I am in contact with the, the Nadius library, and my first option is to make this sort of a page on their own website so that the manuscript and the digital edition are presented through the same institution. Now I just have to verify with them what would be some of the criteria. Uh, ideally, initially, we are going to have a view of the Aegean with all the various uh, islands. Here, you can see that I have chosen to focus on Corfu, the first island in the itinerary, and also the first one on which we work since the beginning to use as a model. So this is then the digital edition itself with a space for the presentation of the manuscript facsimile, the Latin translation and the English translation. Uh, we are working on synchronizing the facsimile with the Latin and the English. And then to the side of the English, there is the possibility by clicking on this I to access the commentary itself. So here, for example, I'm choosing Sant'Angelo. So if you would click on number two, you would access this where you can find the explanation then for the Byzantine fortress of Angelo Castro, a little bit of historical and uh, architectural information, and then the link, uh, bibliography, so traditional bibliography on the various authors and um, collections that deal with the monument, and then the link to the various resources. Here you have Wikidata, but also a very nice website, which is not um, created within an academic institution, but it's um, very well done, focus on castles in Greece. So here you have the possibility then to go directly, for example, to this page and retrieve further information on the castle. In uh, the other paragraph, there was then the reference to Corcira or Paleopolis. The uh, expression he uses is uh, Corcira Olim, so the ancient city of Corcira. And again, you have the same criteria the bibliography and some references to relevant websites and resources to deepen your knowledge about Portia. In particular, I'm linking this to Topos text, which is this um, uh, website and also app created by Brady Kisling, an independent scholar based in uh, Athens, where you have the immediate linking to other resources, such as Travelog or Pleiades. But most important, you can then read 
the uh, ancient authors that deal with that locality. So actually you don't really have to put in the bibliography all the references, but uh, you access this page and you find already all the relevant authors covering the place you're interested in. As I said, uh, an interesting part is represented by the map and the possibility to uh, use the map to access the information. While at Stanford, with the support of a student, we tried georeferencing the map using GIS. But to be honest, it was more an exercise for the student who needed an internship than something that I saw fit and useful. And I, I tried to explain, but I mean, it was fun in a certain sense and it was useful because there was this, uh, this exchange. But of course, it's, it's not a, a viable uh, methodology because Wonder Monty's map are too abstract and still too far from modern cartography to um, allow a, an overlapping. And actually, the more accurate you, you, you try to be, the worse it gets, because on the Montes map then becomes a sort of a gum that goes in every direction. So in a very, in a certain sense, simplistic way, I opted to have a just a position of the two geographical support, the old map and the modern map. Also because in, in, in this project from the beginning, I'm not trying to discover new places based on Juan del Monte, but for me as an archeologist who is trying to underline the importance of Juan del Monte as a archeologist, traveling in person and visiting places is the opposite process. For me, it's interesting to see that he was there in places that we know already <laughs> before every, everybody else. So to me, this comparison is good enough for the scope of the project. As you can see, the maps themselves have annotation with names of places. Most of the places you find on the maps are also mentioned in the text. So actually, a, a lot of these toponyms are already discussed in the commentary, but not always. There are some exceptions and some toponyms are present only on the map and not in the text. So here, you have Porchira Olim, uh, for example. You can see how he nicely drew next to it a series of fallen columns and uh, ruins to qualify this place as the ancient site of Corfu. And this is not obvious because by then the modern settlement was located on the coast and it was becoming a flourishing uh, port under the Venetian occupation. But he is speaking instead of an inland place where only in the end of the 19th century, modern excavations then located the uh, presence of the ancient Greek colony. So if you click then on Porchira Olim, you visualize the location of Porchira, the ancient Greek colony on the map, and you access this brief description with some notes and the list of the resources that I mentioned already and that are part of this archeological network of tools that can then help you uh, deepening your understanding of each place. Of course, in addition to the uh, other layer, it's possible to visualize the uh, 
the map also with this more physical rendering. In this case here, you are looking at uh, Castel Sant'Angelus, the same uh, Angelo Castro that we talked about in the text. And of course, you can then go and see the actual ruins of the place. As I said, some of the toponyms are not present in the text. For example, in this case, on the mainland, he is indicating Turris Sayate. It's the Sayaka Tower. It's a fortification. It's a fortif it's part of a fortification that was built probably during the Venetian occupation of the area to protect the local salt pan. And uh, in fact, saline salt pans are one of the elements that he is particularly sensitive. Again, through the access to Castra the website on castles, you have the possibility to see the present state of the monument and if you want then access further information. So then I have the link to the actual thing. It's not yet available online, but if we have time, now that I have offered you an idea, uh, I can try to show it online or we can have questions and see if there is the possibility. Yeah, yeah no, we think we, we can't do it from, should I do it from the from this is what you saw. Um, here you have the definition of Kerkira. You can access Pleiades which is this gazetteer that gives uh, a reference to the ancient name places. So it's also offering a good link between these medieval, early, modern uh, um, topography and the names and the history of places in the past. If you're interested about the reference to the mythology, you have Manto, which is a database on uh, mythology and um, mythological events. And yes, the comments are tagged so that in theory then it will be possible in case, let's say you are a botanist, let's say, and you only want to find references that deal with trees and plants, you have the possibility then to retrieve only the comments that pertain to that specific. Now, these are a minority, but just to give you an example that you can also then conduct uh, specific researches. The tags are geography, botanics, etymology, mythology, and then uh, monuments, settlements, and uh, archaeology. Uh, also, I forgot to mention that in terms of the transcription, I'm not introducing any change. I'm just transcribing the text as it is. I'm just uh, loosening the um, abbreviation, but I'm offering some uh, sort of like corrections only when there are textual problems that make the 
understanding of the text itself problematic. And that's because, as I said, I don't want to present these as a, any kind of philological edition, but focus on the geospatial and uh, more archaeological historical component of what the Liber Insularum has to offer rather than on the textual scholarship itself. Okay, so I think that's um, an idea and then I'm happy to answer questions or I think Daniele is also available for those of you who have more technical uh, issues and would like to know more about that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, now everyone is invited to either post a question in the chat or just raise your hand if you're online attending or raise your hand uh, uh, here um, uh, for real in the seminar room and yeah, ask any questions uh, you uh, are interested in or to learn more about. Yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. That's I was wondering uh, on uh, what was the biggest uh, challenge that you think is the biggest for them? Okay, <laughs> honest question. <laughs> I mean, I have a good question, and I'll give you an honest answer because I think the majority of the people here um, know my background and how I arrived to this idea. I arrived to uh, the VDPH with, I, I think, a, a quite good idea of what I wanted because I had been working on Bon del Monte and the Liber for 20 years. So I was kind of like obsessed in a certain sense to make this stuff more visible and, and kind of like exploit as much as possible what this text had to offer. So I, the front end was my, my goal. And the biggest challenge uh, for someone like me that knew little, or we can say zero, about digital humanities was then learning the process that you need to start something like this and arrive possibly to some kind of visual front end. So it's in a certain sense, I was naive because I imagine you know, the product. I wasn't so interested in the method. Uh, and I just wanted the result. Instead, as you see, it took me three years and probably I'm not even done just to, just to obtain what I wanted or close to, to, to what I wanted. So I, I think it was very instructive because it gave me the possibility to learn from scratch the, the process involved in digital humanities and possibly even if I don't know if my colleagues are or not learning a, a little bit of the mentality. I still consider myself a very traditional, in a certain sense, scholar. But I think this experience gave me the possibility to understand, at least, not to completely control or, or master, but understand that there is a very different conceptual uh, itinerary that you have to go through if you imagine something digital from just sitting down and, and writing a book. Yeah, so you learned it the hard way, so... Uh, I learned the hard way. I was lucky with, to have with the VDPH. Nice, with nice and friendly people. Yeah, that's uh, what I was going to say. <laughs> okay, yeah, and I mean, uh, the Gematis projects are always collaborative, so it's yeah. actually fine the domain expert, the archaeologist, attempting to create a digital edition needs to be uh, uh, facilitated, or the work needs to be facilitated by collaborators. And that's the, that's the um, difficult thing to provide the resources, to find the competences. And that's, I think, what's special about our center here, that we have people like uh, uh, Daniele Fusi or uh, other people working in the field who are um, yeah. experts in digital scholarly editing. And then to put this all together, or digital archaeologists and so on. So that's all about collaboration. Yeah. Three yeah. years ago, this time I was taking the intro class 
to digital and public humanities with, with France. I would have been one of your colleagues. Well, one day you will be sitting here presenting your, well, your you're, Marie Curie you're gonna, project. You're going to be a lot faster than me because coming from my you know, generation and my kind of like resistance, I was slow, but I, I'm proud of myself because I challenge my my old mentality and, and I was able to do it because I think I had a goal. I had um, something that I really care for and I had some strong, from my perspective, academic um, questions. Here's a nice question in the chat. So uh, uh, Georgia Agostini, you can also raise your voice if you like, uh, Georgia, is asking if it is possible to move back to the slide where you uh, list the entities that are marked and uh, Another very good question, which I teach my students always to look after when we talk about scholarly editions, where is the code? Uh, so where is the markup? You are so, the... uh, so here is... Is, is no, this the one she... I don't think that's it. She, uh, maybe Georgia, if you want to guide... Sorry. Yeah? Can you... Ah, there yeah. You can it's not this one, it's like, I think it's, it was... Uh, bef yes, thank you. Yes. Yes. Right. Ah, okay. <laughs> Do we have a specific question or do we want to uh, elaborate can, can about you, that? Can you see it? Can you see it online? Yes. Yeah, you, okay. you can see yeah. it online. And uh, yeah, maybe also a question to um, Daniel or yourself. What about the encoding behind this presentation? You ask Daniel for that part. Okay, Daniel. <laughs> now, please show up. Where are you? Okay. Hi, yeah. here. Can you see me and hear yeah. me? We can hear you well. I don't know here in the room. Not so good. I, I just turn the speakers to the crowd. Say it again. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, can we raise the... Um, uh, now we have maximum. Yeah, maybe that works now, Daniela, go ahead. Okay. Please. Yeah, that's good. So it will be long to explain, but uh, in a few words, uh, we have no XMLTI to start with because uh, in this approach, XMLTI is just an output among many other outputs you can get from the software and from the system. So in this case, we have just started with legacy material, especially for Corfu and other islands, which already had Word documents as a starting point. So in this case, we use the first uh, uh, conversion framework, which uh, enabled us uh, to migrate uh, text uh, into a database. And this database is modeled according to the Cadmus framework uh, approach. So it's uh, highly modular. And this uh, also um, covers text and layers of annotations on top of it. So you not uh, necessarily have just one layer of annotations on the text. In this case, we have the comment layer annotations, which is uh, a sort of complex uh, object with its uh, structure, which is the comment itself, but also references, uh, tags, uh, categories, and all the stuff you can see in the website. And in this case, we got this information by analyzing words or by directly inputting it in the user interface. And once we have these layers of annotations on top of the text, uh, the software is able eventually to create TI or XML or whatever other output we want. In this case, we are just using the database directly because we have a front end which uh, gets data from the database. So as uh, you uh, update database, database, the site is uh, updated too. But there are, of course, other kinds of output you can use. But if I can uh, uh, extend the question, so that there will, so for now there's not planned that there is a TI export, TI XML export button, uh, because first you would have to have a TI model that matches the contents of the database, right? Yeah, not necessarily because we can just have a TI model which matches a subset of the contents uh, of the database. Uh, this is possible for uh, some projects because uh, in some projects you have so many layers of annotations on top of the text uh, 
that you can't just have them all in one single TI document. At least you have to recur to many different uh, TI documents connected to the TI document representing the text. So using standoff annotation. But of course, this is something which can be done by a machine, but it's very difficult to be done by hands. Thank you also from Georgia here in the chat. Um, more questions? I wanted to. Yeah, you know. Please. Yeah, please. Um, first of all, thank you because it's a very interesting uh, project. I, I was wondering uh, because now it's uh, uh, the Libre itself, of course, it's a very important document and you've been studying it, and now you made it uh, into a digital and public. Um, website eventually. Yeah. Uh, how can it be useful for archaeologists? Like um, we we have seen that uh, the cartography is not very precise, so I, I cannot take measurements, but it's fine. We know it's historical cartography. We use mm -hmm. just like that. Um, how? But how is is it precise? In, like in in his maps. Does the um, commit errors? Uh, do, do we when you studied like in depth the single island, like you you showed mm -hmm. us, you uh, annotated the single places in points, mm -hmm. um, and I agree that's the best way to do it. A GIS <laughs> georeferencing uh, of that is not it's just not possible. Um, but I think in this way you just adding like the slides you showed us. They were very interesting. I was wondering, do you have, did you find something that was missing, something that you couldn't uh, explain, maybe, and maybe you know, uh, some site that actually opens new research questions for archaeology? Okay. Like yeah, I see. So first of all, I intend this as a contribution to the history of archaeology. Okay, not just as a tool for archaeologists okay. on the field, but I didn't give you all the background. But my interest goes back to my uh, professor in Florence, Besky, who wrote this essay on the rediscovery of Greece, and he opened up saying there is Christopher Wondermonti, he's the first. It would be interesting to know more about his text, and uh, a commentary would help shed light on the humanistic perception of Greece and the rediscovery of Greece. So I think that, first of all, a tool like this really gives you a better understanding of why Juan del Monte can be considered a pioneer archaeology by the fact that he goes places, there is a special component in his um, record that, as an archaeologist, you know, it's it's the foundation of archaeology, topography, the survey, the, the autopsy. So in this, it's the first level of contribution. Um, as I mentioned, I don't think, and I never thought that you can discover new things based on the analysis of his work, because it's the opposite way around. What I'm doing, I am, in certain cases, going back and adding a bit to the early. So uh, speaking of, let's say, Delos, the colossal statue of Apollo, we all know the Nazian Apollo, but if you want to know who is the first scholar, when do we have the first description of the status, you find it there and you can read that already, let's say in 1415, 1420, the colossal statue of Apollo was in fragments and uh, he had to lift it. I mean, he tried to lift it up, but that's funny because it's an anastilosy <laughs> attempt with his crew. So this is the kind of things. Or for example, I've been contacted by a group of people doing research on Kimolos, there is not a specific ch chapter on Kimolos. He's dealing Kimolos together with Milos. And actually, there is a problem because he's um, splitting the name Kimolos with Argentiera. So sometimes, instead of solving 
so uh, offering solutions is actually creating uh, a little bit of a, of a new problem. But for those people, this name Argentiera, it's very useful because it's the first attestation of this name in alternative to Kimolos, suggesting the presence of a silver mine. And because there they have spotted what they think could be a silver mine in use during the early Venetian occupation, then you, you yeah, that's, have that's yeah. what I meant. Yeah, so or, yeah. Stefano, and then the screen. I was wondering to what extent and to what extent the website and the, the platform is divided and separate sections or not. For example, will there be possible to find all the uh, all the different maps uh, in one general yeah. single map? What? Uh, and mm -hmm. yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, uh, will there be possible uh, uh, will it be possible to perform a text search uh, over the, the entire text? Uh, or maybe looking for different places, uh, uh, location by location names, building names. And also I have another side question, which is, uh, will it be possible, uh, will it, the, the access to the website only be uh, reserved to registered users? Because at some point I saw in the upper, upper right corner, the, the login button. Yeah. That's... So that's, that this was my, my other video. Okay, so I'll, I'll start from this last uh, part. So the idea is to have something online available to everybody, even to a larger audience and uh, ideally even, you know, independent travelers or, or uh, school classes that have an interest. And for example, in Greece, there is an interest even at school level for this kind of material because it's, it's very like part of their curriculum. So the, the, the fruition, I'm thinking to make it open. Oh, yeah. Okay. No, no. And uh, instead, the contribution, uh, this is something that we have to filter. I'll be totally honest with you. The Gennadius, its interest in having these like digital edition online, they are not so enthusiastic. And that's where we're going to have some problems. So I have to kind of like negotiate and, and see about keeping it open to future additions. Because as we all know, projects and I am myself in a month or so done with the Mercury and they don't know if they can guarantee the resources for the update. So if I probably, if I insist on, on keeping this on their website, I cannot promise it's going to be really uh, open to addition. If my academic future <laughs> continues, then I get another grant or another, you know, way <laughs> to support this project and itself, I will see if I can explore uh, another option. For what concern the, the places, uh, you, you were asking if it, it will be possible to search by places. It, it will be, and actually I didn't show you because it's something that came in very recently and I haven't been able to pass this to Stefano and Luca to update the visualization. Brady Kisling, the, the same guy I mentioned uh, for Topos text, generously agreed during the summer and uh, he manually annotated every single place and every single uh, name entity on the manuscript, linking it to Wikidata. I already have a, a spreadsheet with all these materials. So I think, and here Daniele can kind of confirm, but I think that once you have this data, it will be possible. And even the text won't look, um, as I was showing you. You mentioned the tags. Uh, if I, rather than looking for the tag, the botanics and for the word Yeah, no, no, yeah. Uh, or now flower, I don't know if at that extent we are going to be so uh, specific because as archaeologists, we were concentrating more in, in the, so here. Here, 
we already have a version of this English text, which is the hyperlink to Wikidata. And we have a spreadsheet with all this material. What Brady concentrated on are um, toponyms, of, I mean, name of places, name of people, whether mythological or real, some historical events that are easily recognizable, and uh, ethnic names, names of people like uh, Lombards or Romans or Turks. These are the entities that we were focusing on. In the commentary, of course, I'll, I will uh, expand. But there is going to be this first level where it's possible and also conduct a search the opposite way around. For what concerns the maps, yes, I, I hope to have the possibility to show just I mean, I, I want to have all the maps, and also I, I'm not able to show it here uh, at the beginning, the possibility to see the manuscript uh, in its entirety. So with um, all the pages of the manuscript, because even if I'm not a manuscript studies person, I think the, 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 the reality, the physicality of the object and the possibility just to look at the pages as they are is something that add. Just to welcome in the very back of the room, there's uh, Katarina Capinato, Vice Dean of yeah. uh, Internationalizzazione, and she, we will meet you again in the Stanford visit week when there's a conference uh, uh, dedicated to uh, the uh, Marie Curie project, and you will be the guide for Greek. <laughs> Greek uh, traces in Venice, right? Yeah. yeah. So we look very much yeah. towards. Uh, into the... Yeah, this will happen on Friday at 3 30, leaving from the Kafoskari courtyard. And it's open to the public, and everybody is welcome. Uh, there was a question from. Uh, 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 yeah. But thank, thank you, you so for much. popping in. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. See you soon. Okay. Yeah. Bye bye. Uh, I, I think you have to shout that uh, to make sure everyone can. Oh, oh, you come closer. But now I touched something. I hope I didn't. Yeah, <laughs> if you come closer, that's that's the best solution. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the talk. It was super interesting. I'm not but I myself come more from the manuscript side, so I was interested because you clarified that you weren't that interested in focusing on the textual um, part, which is obviously a <laughs> say another universe. Uh, but I was wondering if there you encountered some instances where actually the reference to other textual differences would clarify or, or add something where you weren't sure if you would maybe insert that somehow or or maybe in future, like you said, it would be collaborative in the future. So maybe if that would be an option to to open it up to more, let's say, also comparison between the different manuscripts. So yes, definitely in my own approach, I have used um, the possibility to compare with other manuscripts whether they are the published ones or a few that I have that I have acquired to solve um, the textual problems. Some of them, some of the problems are found in all the manuscripts. In other instances, the comparison with another manuscript, it helps. Uh, to be honest, again, keeping always in mind my background and my focus, I'm limiting my comments in what I call the, the text or um, component to big problems that really affect the understanding. So if my manuscript is, is saying que instead of it, or is using um, a slightly different word to refer to the same um, object, I'm, I'm not bothering. But in some instances, there are problems. For example, um, at some point he's speaking in, in the Corfu 
uh, paragraph, he's speaking of uh, Tournamentis. And Tournamentis, it's this, he's describing the ancient uh, settlement and he's uh, mentioning, I think, uh, columns, columnas, and then Tournamentis. And Tournamentis, like tournament, doesn't make any sense in, in, in that context. So here I'm, I'm looking at proposing that it's probably something like ornamentis because in other passages that's the combination of words he's using to refer to, to ruins. So does this problem also extend to maps? Let's say are there annotations or maybe later editions that local editions that maybe add? Uh, okay, that's a very complex uh, question and it's you know it's it's a very um, how can I say, a legitimate question. In fact, uh, I think she's also uh, present uh, in, the, in the online audience. There is a young German scholar, her name is Beatrice Luma. She is working on the visual component of the manuscript. She's studying the cartographic uh, tradition from the point of view of the visuals. And we are working kind of understand, trying to see if it's possible to associate at least groups of uh, manuscripts. There are some variations, as I mentioned, some manuscripts don't have maps, some manuscripts have maps, but they don't have annotations, some manuscripts have a richer apparatus of annotations where it's evident that whoever copied a manuscript is far even in time from Wondermonti. So I think it's the Dusseldorf uh, Codex. It has annotations on monuments and on Constantinople that uh, clearly post date the fall of Constantinople. This one, it's kind of like in the average range. I'm not saying it's the closer to the original because I'm not. You know, I'm not daring to say anything like that, even if, uh, uh, but it's for sure part of the Vulgata. And for me to study the impact of this text in Europe, it's important what Bondelmonti saw, but it's also important to see what the majority of the humanists in Rome, in Florence, or in Paris got to know, because then Ciria Codancona or, or later travelers had an average knowledge based probably on this average version. Yeah, excellent questions because it opens the whole perspective of, of this uh, uh, foundational work, I think, in, in the digital. So, I mean, what the edition already uh, achieves is to connect to online resources here and there, which are crucial for uh, uh, ancient studies, archaeological research. The other question is how open is the in, uh, edition to be then integrated or used in other projects, which you made very wise decisions. I think we discussed this also from the very start. So you are not a philologist, you are not to, you are interested in, in philology or in textual yeah. variants, but that's not your, your aim. And you are interested in the maps, but you are not what someone who can, can recall yeah. or, or critically assess graphical variants. But now that the resource is there, so what can other people do with it? Yeah. And what is the perspective to really open up then all the information? Textual data, visual data, commentary, and and also the, the things you identify to create further nets of, of knowledge with other resources or new resources. So that's also maybe maybe you can say something about the perspectives you how you want to move on here, or maybe also a question for to to Daniela. Yeah. What's what's the potential of the uh, of the data that has been created in the course of this project? Yeah, for the data in itself, uh, uh, Cadmus uh, as a framework uh, was designed uh, right to be expandable because it's modular. So one idea was uh, eventually to open uh, not only the website as it is now, but also uh, the editor of beta in some sort of controlled environment so that uh, we can get a community work inside the database directly. So we may create uh, 
special models uh, and editors for any uh, specialized uh, kind of data we want to add to the edition. So instead of creating another one from scratch, you are just adding new specialized annotations on top of the existing material. And this may happen for single scholars or for communities who can log in once uh, authorized and then uh, either contributions uh, directly into the database. Yeah, and I think uh, now with, from what I understand about digital humanities and in particular text to a scholarship, even if I'm not the one who is interested in doing it, with, for example, the the you know the transcription in uh, TEI or any other format, if in the future there's going to be a scholar who wants to proceed with this comparison of various manuscripts, it's one contribution. Of course, he will have to do a lot more because there are at least 69 more manuscripts, but this is just a little contribution for also this kind of uh, textual reconstruction of the tradition of the liver. Okay, thank you very, very much. Uh, if there are no other existential questions, uh, urgent questions, uh, I think that is a um, perfect uh, finish here for our discussion. So you uh, move on uh, with this, finalizing this. Uh, thank you very much, Juan, once again, Benedetta. No, thank you. Thank you, everyone in the audience and uh, at home and uh, wherever you are and here um, in Cafosa. We are going to have an aperitivo now, I suppose, well, sir. on uh, the campus on Marco. Everyone is very much invited to join us. Uh, we will uh, meet again, uh, if not earlier, but uh, the next seminar will be on the uh, 11th of October. Uh, also, as part of the Stanford Exchange, there will be Mark L.G. Hewitt, so a, a rising star in digital literary studies, so truth and climate fiction, communicating real world facts through unreal words, uh, words. Uh, yeah, so same place, same, no, not, not same place, place. Aha, so we will be at, at Sala Berengo in Kaposkari, so with a view to the Canale Grande, so uh, it's really worthwhile to, to come and see. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for those of you interested in the archaeology component, as I said, there's going to be this conference on uh, October 12th and 13th. is at Lezattere, the multicultural space of Kafoskari. The first day, it's more about traditional scholarship. Uh, so the rediscovery of Greece and um, travelers, early travelers to Greece. The second day in the morning, we'll have a presentation of various digital projects that deal with the geospatial um, dimension of Greece and uh, ancient Greece. And you are all welcome to attend in presence.